Hey everyone. Good morning. Good morning, Defcon. Good morning. Good morning. Just come on. I'm I, I flew like 20 hours from India to uh, Las Vegas. <laughs> come on. Good morning, Defcon. Good morning. Now we got it. So we have an amazing panel here. My name is uh, Abhijit Babirajan Renuga. I know how that sounds. So I call myself ABX, much, much shorter, so that the people will not be ruining my name, right? So I used to be called many things, but ABX is kind of very, very simple. Uh, I, I, I manage, I lead the Advisory Village at Dufcon for the past like 45 years, right? So it's, we are all there. After this panel, maybe you can come there, listen to the talks, workshops, all this stuff, amazing stuff happening in there. And uh, I'm handing out the mic to the amazing panel here. They will introduce themselves, and uh, we can start insulting each other. Thank you. I'll go. I'm what's his face, Adam Pennington. Um, I'm with a nonprofit called the Mitre Corporation, where I run a cybersecurity framework called Mitre Attack. I've been with Mitre a long, long time at this point. I helped gather a lot of the data that we used to originally create Attack through a series of honey pots with state actors. And so I've been watching this space for a pretty long time. Hi, I'm Stryker. Um, I am the head of security communications and planning and SCP. And yes, that acronym was on purpose. Um, uh, with the Adversary Pursuit Group, uh, that's the Threat Intel and Threat Research Unit uh, within Blackpoint Cyber. Uh, we're an MDR, which means that we actually get a lot of information from both the feedback. Um, we get a lot of information from both end user environments from a wide range of uh, clients from healthcare and critical infrastructure all the way through your service based industries um, and your local mom and pop shop. Um, and so we get both the supply chain moments of them attacking directly the MSPs and then our end clients, uh, which leads to some really interesting uh, research and intel that our teams have been working on. So uh, looking forward to sharing that. Oh, also, if you're going to pitch the adversary village, uh, come visit later at the Lonely Hackers Club. Uh, I'm an admin. It's lots of fun. Uh, and then the XR Village. So. I'm the guy that can't work a microphone. Uh, my name is Ken. I'm the VP of AI for Omni Federal. Uh, previous to that role, I was a White House Presidential Innovation Fellow for four years, where I got to see some pretty interesting, fun attacks and. I'm looking forward to sharing some of those experiences with you all today. Hi, everyone. I'm Nikhil Mittal. Uh, I'm the founder of Alto Security. We are a small organization that train people in uh, you know, red teaming on-prem, Azure, etc. So we expect some stuff on Microsoft from me. I'm pretty interested in that. <laughs> now that uh, the introductions are over, I'm going to start from the right end with Adam. So like I mentioned, the, the panel topic is about uh, the formidable advisories and threat actor. So I think uh, Adam has a long experience on identifying and, you know, uh, putting these threat actors in the light. Yeah, so attack tracks uh, publicly available threat intelligence information on lots of different adversary groups. And we've been doing that since our creation back in 2013 to 2015. And so everything I'm going to be talking about is coming from publicly available open source intelligence sources. But state hackers are not a new thing. We've known about it for a long time. It's been going on for a while. It's been in the public eye for a pretty long time, too, back to, you know, the cuckoo's nest in the 80s, which might have had a role in, not, not a terrific one. But, you know, and so it's, it's been something that is been out there. We saw the, a lot more awareness coming with the APT1 report and then uh, Russian hacking with the elections. Uh, and so we've seen a lot of these waves, you know, North Korean ransomware. And, and more recently, we've seen a lot of activity where uh, China has become prevalent again, where we're seeing you know, sophisticated activity happening across a lot of organizations, some successful activity. And so we're seeing trends in a lot of these spaces. I, I flinch a little bit at the word sophisticated. I, kn I know it was in the panel description, but most threat actors are exactly as sophisticated as they need to be in a given uh, situation. If they're any good, they're not usually pulling out sort of the big guns unless they have to. Uh, but in places where we've been seeing the defenses get a lot better, people are watching their networks, people are watching their end systems, 
and it's gotten a lot harder to work your way through a network. I, you know, those of you who are red teamers probably know this too, that you know the space has gotten harder. And so we've seen adversaries who are interested in not getting caught, and sometimes ransomware not so much, but you know, a state actor that wants to steal information and be in a network for months or years needs to not get caught or not get completely caught in order to meet their goals. And so we're seeing a, a more and more of a trend of adversaries getting into places that we don't watch. And so it's, it's a natural place to be. It's nothing that we didn't know was possible. It's you know, not incredibly surprising, but adversaries getting into routers. We saw a lot of reporting on routers last year uh, and system security devices. So finding a lot of zero days in the devices that we actually bought to protect our networks, getting into those and using those as pivot points has been a popular trend to get into VMware ESX servers. So getting into places where we can't run an ADR, the, they're not supported, we don't know how to see there, and so you more and more buried into the system. Uh, we've also seen a trend lately with adversaries getting into security cameras. And so crappy Linux devices that we have no security on, have no way of adding security to. And so we're going to have to be looking at some other places to actually spot this activity. Um, that actually reflects a lot of what we've been seeing in the wild with a lot of our different client bases, to be honest. Um, I would say that in addition to some of the really neat hackery kind of almost admirable things and sophisticated, maybe less just clever, unexpected ways that um, nation state level threat actors are using, they do make their way down into the pipeline. There is a whole undercurrent on the dark web of people selling everything from malware and ransomware to initial access and even phishing as a service. I have seen extremely sophisticated UI that look like, you know, HubSpot or Salesforce is gonna send you an email, like no before, but for bad guys. It, it's pretty sophisticated. So the tactics and techniques that we're seeing at the APT level eventually do trickle down to the script kitties who are just spamming out things to all of the different um, organizations at the same time. And one of the things to add to that um, is going to be, uh, we're seeing a lot more of living off the land tactics. Um, people who are using and abusing either red team tools that were developed explicitly for research, um, in packet, et cetera, um, or they're using and abusing scripts and systems and controls within the endpoints themselves that were designed for system admins to make their lives easier. I mean, remote desktop protocol guys, like it's designed for somebody with privilege to go in and fix another user's computer. Boy, I can't imagine how an adversary is gonna use that, right? That's an easy lateral movement. And you get such friction from the business side to turn that off because what's the solution in an increasingly remote world? So really what we've discovered is one, you have to be really careful. Allow listing and block listing doesn't matter as much anymore. I mean, obviously make sure that you have a centralized uh, software center and, and we can get more into remediations later. Um, but the major threat actors we've been seeing lately have just been using and abusing these particular tools. And so it's time that we stop talking about IOCs explicitly. And it's time that we start talking to MITRE's point about how they're abusing these tools and how we can sense that change in behavior if you really want to do something about it. The biggest thing that I always think about when I'm considering state-sponsored uh, state attacks is scale. It's the amount of resources that state sponsors can commit to it. Uh, it's uh, entire job and workforce. So the days are gone when I could reliably hope for a single adversary. That's never the case. So now I'm up against teams who has a lot of money, a lot of compute, and very, very distributed with interesting, sophisticated attacks to spend their own R&D money on. That's the landscape of sponsored attacks. And that stuff, to your point, does trickle down where we're now seeing the dark net, some of those same tech from a few years back available as a service. And the next evolution to change the individual players are models like White Raven Neo that allows you to ask a AI without guardrails, hey, how do I do a DDoS? And it gives you a pretty simple example in Python. 
So now we have tools that can supercharge the average person to become a one person team. And that is pretty terrifying to think about. And now let's add that to the state sponsor level. All that R&D money, all that resource, all that GPU access, that's the current reality we're up against. Good working. So uh, I would, I would uh, agree to what other panelists say, but one thing that I would like to add here is uh, when we talk about advanced adversaries, are we really defending even for normal attacks? So if you look at you know uh, any previous hack, as I said, Microsoft, for example, if an organization at the level of Microsoft, or for that matter, any tech organization, they get compromised just using a password spray attack. That's not absolutely anything that is sophisticated. You know, just so blowing our own trumpet here. So when we when we teach, let's say Azure Red Team, we don't even consider password spraying as a valid attack. We mention that and we say, okay, this is not going to work against Azure without testing. I mean, that is the sort of confidence we had, we used to have on Microsoft. So what I think is lacking wherever, whether, whether it is the advanced adversaries or your good attackers like penetration testers or red teamers, is the basic hygiene. Are you still leaving credentials in clear text on shares in an internal environment? Well, yes, probably. So that doesn't need any research, any research budget at all. So that is what I would like to bring in. Go for the basic hygiene doesn't need an advanced adversary to read your credentials or, you know, have an SMB relay attack or for that matter, I mean, you know, uh, sending a phishing link to one of your employees. So defense in depth, not even that basic security hygiene. If you follow that, you can actually stop, you know, using it once again from Microsoft's marketing, 99% of the attacks. That's true. So that is what my point is on, on top of that. Uh, I would add something for red teamers, give them time. If you are in an organization, thanks. If you're in a position to make a decision, do not get your red team operations done in a week. Don't do that, please. Provide the good attackers more time. You know, APTs include the word persistent. Have persistently tested your stuff. It's not going to happen in a week or two where you give a couple of IPs to your good attackers and say that, okay, this is these are our firewall IPs. Let's see if you can get your domain admin. That's not unfortunately how it is going to be for the actual attackers. Uh, yeah, and one more thing for the red teamers, domain admin is not everything. Don't do, go for that all the time. Yeah, that's for me. I uh, stand with uh, Nikhil on this because uh, he taught a, a generation of young hackers in India uh, with respect to uh, red teaming, right? <laughs> uh, I also would like to add a point in there, a humiliating on. So I, I was performing uh, red teaming for one of my clients, right? I'm not going to tell their night, maybe. I, I not, okay. I should not. So uh, I found a service, like he mentioned, the hygiene. I have seen a service account in there that has been waiting for me for the last 18 years. They created that Sakti service account in there when I was studying in my, I don't know, maybe eighth or ninth standard. And it was there for like waiting for me, come and break me, come and break me. I'm waiting for you, right? It was there for 18 years. It was like within a couple of minutes, we got that. I was amazed. Okay, this is when the password was last changed. That was in 2000, yeah, 2002, I guess, right? This is the basic security hygiene is important because if you are looking at the attacks happening around the globe, they are not, sometimes they are not even using a sophisticated attack vector. They're just getting in, uh, you know, by brute forcing SSH, brute forcing RDP or, you know, finding stolen credentials. I mean, these are very, 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 uh, you know, basic uh, matter of security hygiene. I am not going to take much more time because once I start talking, then done. Okay, I am going to uh, give back to the panel so that they can share their insights on how even the major organizations are getting breached, right? Uh, some of them are considered to be impenetrable, right? So I'm going to, you know. Pass it back. Can you start with me again? Yeah. Okay, I guess starting with me again. Uh, so 
MITRE's got a pretty good example of this. Uh, we came out in public a uh, matter of months ago that uh, we had had a, a breach into a lab network at MITRE. Uh, and so, you know, adversary had used a couple of zero days against the security appliance, had gotten into the ESX infrastructure that was within that lab. Uh, and so, you know, we, we try pretty hard at security. Um, but you know, there we we patched as fast as the patches were available. We we watched the stuff as as well as we could, but they were getting into places that uh, just hadn't necessarily been seen yet, or you know, just a couple days ahead of the the zero days. Uh, and so, I, you know, I'd like to suggest, and I, I know some people in sort of software hardening might get mad at me for this, but that if an adversary is willing to dedicate enough resources to it they are going to get into their target. You know, if, if um, it doesn't work through some sort of connected means, you always have close access operations, you can, you know, send somebody to the environment. And so it's, you know, one of the reasons that even organizations that are getting a lot right are still having problems is that, you know, we do have pl uh, places that are willing to escalate right up until they succeed. Uh, and so as, as long as that's going on, as long as we have people sort of willing to dedicate resources, and as long as you're a juicy enough target, you know, it is, uh, you're going to have to sort of deal with containment, deal with uh, being able to detect it, deal with the fallout, rather than, than just assuming that you can keep them out. Uh, we also just have so many interconnected complex systems. Uh, and so cloud has definitely uh, made this harder, where we have you know, new systems that can get uh, adversaries can get into more challenging visibility in being able to monitor those systems, and just creating a, a bigger surface now that people have access to. That's very similar to what we've been observing on our level, which um, I, I can't disclose who our clients are, but we see. Um, we're certainly not protecting the NSA yet. Um, that said, a lot of the attacks that we've been seeing are opportunistic. So to the point of basic security hygiene, you don't need a pen test to know that you need to get business buy-in to get MFA enabled, right? Um, it's the trick of convincing them that this is worth doing. Um, and to that, I can I can add a couple of stories. Um, for example, uh, about one out of every four or one out of every five of the people that we onboard uh, at our MDR are in the middle of an active BEC, uh, business email compromise. They had no idea that they were compromised. Um, we would go in as part of the onboarding process and our SOC will get tickets all the time. Hey, uh, we're pinging, can, can you uh, isolate that for us, please? Thank you. Um, and they got it as a preventative without knowing that they were actively infected and, and um, in some cases for months uh, before they were able to detect that. And so to reiterate, it, if they want to get in, they're going to get in. And even if you're not a major organization, all it takes is one person to get in. And I think part of the problem here is that we're dealing with people don't like the idea of them going into our home. This, uh, our servers, our environment, our endpoints, this is this is where we live in a digital era, especially if you work from home. There is something very personal and intimate. And thinking about somebody inside your system is a little bit like coming home and having the door wide open and seeing muddy footprints in front of you. It terrifies you. So you spend bazillions of dollars preventing that from ever being seen. But the adversaries are sophisticated enough, even at a script kitty level, um, thanks to trickle down um, dark web economics, I suppose, um, that they're cleaning up after themselves and the door is very carefully locked behind them. You cannot tell. And so what I would recommend and, and reiterate is that you can spend all of this money on every phishing email attention and, and antivirus and EDR. Those are important core technologies that you need for both compliance and just getting rid of the kind of the base level, but don't think that you've stopped everyone. Um, we had a supply chain attack actually uh, with a critical infrastructure partner. Um, it was a supply chain business email compromise that I'm thinking of specifically. Um, their partner was compromised, but didn't know it. And one of their personnel sent an email that was expected. They wrote it all nine. Um, 
to our protected critical infrastructure environment um, about a meeting and it had an attachment and it wasn't the attachment, uh, the email uh, PDF that was actually the, the, the vector. It was the image file in the signature line, which was freaking, it was bad. It was very naughty of them. <laughs> um, but it was just so clever and they had uh, ended up compromising several of that person that um, that other organizations. And, and so these people were sending out completely legitimate emails that were actually phishing. Um, and we tripped up on NT, attempted NTL, NTLM credential theft was how we ended up catching it. Because at that point they got in and it wasn't even your front door, it was somebody else's. And it was a complete, you would never have guessed this was a phishing email. I, I still read this and I'm like, is there a typo? And it was just the, the image in the, in the email subject line, uh, excuse me, uh, signature line. So uh, just just food for thought. At the scale of an organization the size of the United States government, there is no version where they're doing all the security by themselves, where they're going to rely on private industry vendors. There's no version where that's remotely conceivable to replace private industry. At what point do you draw the distinction of how you trust the company? How far do you dig to find out if they have some, at worst, a vulnerability they know but don't disclose? Or roll for the ignorant and something popped. The hardest part isn't whether or not we have to or are willing to rely on these vendors. Uh, without that level of trust, we can't also move this industry forward. We all have jobs for this very reason. And at what point can we start forgiving ways to disclose information that's highly critical but also tightly held? What's the difference between a zero day to hit MITRE or a zero day that hits the White House? Why is one more valuable than the other? Thank you. Um, I would like to add so the, on the same thing on the, on the supply chain stuff. So uh, uh, that is what a lot of us call gentrification of security, hiding stuff behind licenses. You know, you get, you pay more. If you want to be secure, you pay more out of that. So for example, uh, if you are an organization who has, let's say, their voice support, uh, you know, outsourced to Philippines, your tech support to India and, and, and so on, are you sure that the kind of security that your HQ or your main office would have, is that the same thing that your partners have? And I can tell you that coming from a uh, from a poor country uh, that is still developing, I can tell you that no, that's not the case. Having worked from people right away from the easternmost part of the world to the westernmost part, that is something that always stand out. An organization based out of, you know, uh, if we call it the western world, you call it the richer part of the world, the kind of security features and the money that they would have, even if it is the same organization, is going to be entirely different across geographies. And however, there is an internal trust that, okay, this is my US office and that is the same organizations, let's say Bangalore office. So we trust those guys. However, the, the, the level of security controls the money that is spent there that is entirely different. So that is a sort of a supply chain attack that, that you know, goes under the radar. You look at your partners, but not your own offices, if you're a large enough organization. And if you are a small organization that unfortunately not everyone is interested to talk about, where you would have an organization of a thousand people and a couple of IT guys, no, of course, dedicated threat team, then best of luck. No one is interested in talking about you at that time. So for them, I would say, pick up the open source, much hated tools, the OSTs that people create on weekends on their own time, pick them up, run it on your own in your environments and create your own, own IOCs. If you're a small enough organization, no one cares. You have to take care of yourself. So uh, I used to share uh, a story about uh, my, my school days, shamelessly everywhere. Uh, that's about uh, I being bullied in the school. So when I was in the lower primary school, I was not this big. I didn't have a milk mustache. I was a very small guy, very lean guy, right? 
So the other people, they used to bully me a lot. Then my mother, uh, she got me into a karate school. Then uh, after a couple of years, uh, you know, I became a bit taller. Then eventually I became kind of the bully in, the, in my high school days. So here we have been talking about how we have been bullied so far. All these organizations are getting bullied, right? And uh, now it is a time to learn from the wise people here how we can respond to such attacks. So we have seen that, so we have seen that all of these organizations can be bullied, even using a small technique, maybe to the, to the like, you know, Adam's apple, very small technique, right? Maybe you can try talking to your friends, right? So we have seen that all these organizations can be bullied. Now, back to them, how we can respond to these attacks, how can we respond to these incidents in a better way that we could handle things, right? Back at you. So I think people might be expecting for me to, to say use miter attack. Um, and that's not where you want to start. I mean, and so we, we, a couple of people have mentioned hygiene along the way. And, you know, it's, I, it sounds so basic, but making sure that you're getting the basics right first, you know, things like multi-factor authentication, uh, segmentation of privileges, making sure that your network isn't just a flat space that an adversary can dance around, actually patching your systems. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's working your way up through starting to look at behaviors, looking at what people are doing on end systems, sort of more the um, at attack end of things where, where people are using EDRs and whatnot. But I'm a huge fan if you've got your act together on all of those things and he, you know, talking a little bit about how do we bring it back to the adversary. I'm a big fan of uh, direct adversary engagement. So honeypots, deception, actually placing adversaries in environments where you're able to monitor them potentially for long periods of time uh, for a couple different purposes. Uh, one is starting to understand what an adversary might do when they think that they've broken into your environment. If you've, if you've really got things going well and you're able to get somebody to operate, being able to see what exactly those things would be that you, you might find out that they have ready for you. Uh, the other thing is deterrence though. So I've, um, I've had some experience with getting caught doing that by adversaries too. Uh, and what we saw was that they were much more cautious in how they operated in the future. And so they realized that they had been caught. They realized that they had given up some of their trade craft and we saw them back off. We saw them spend more time doing an attack we'd call discovery. So figuring out, am I in the right place? What's the system I'm on? What are the systems around me? Uh, which can be really noisy activity if you're watching for the right things. And so serving as a little bit of, of deterrence. And so, you know, once, once you're beyond the basics and once you're bringing it back to the adversary, um, you know, if you really have all of those things working together, uh, I'm a fan of taking it one step farther and starting to interact with them a bit. I will start with um, MFA, please, please, just MFA. Um, that, that's my security hygiene pitch right there for the day. Just, but okay, so let me build on that then. Why do more organizations not have MFA? Why do more organizations not have these basic security protocols? One, we're overworked and tired and under-resourced, <laughs> just straight out, right? Second reason, people see security not as an insurance policy, but as a cost center. And by people, I mean finance, and I mean the executives who control the budget. They aren't here right now. You are. You are the advocate for every user in your organization. You want to know how you use sophisticated nation state attacks at your organization, regardless of the size? You use it as an example. Executives and people with finance actually understand headlines, right? Find ones that are similar to yours and say, look, we, this, this cost millions scaled down. This could cost us this amount. And of course, do your ALE calculation, percentage of probability of something attacking times the uh, cost of the impact. Remember your soft costs, your knock on costs, your lost contracts and time and reputation. Those are all in addition to whatever your insurance premium is going to go up by, right? 
present that then and then go to them and say, if we enable MFA, it costs like nothing. <laughs> and your executives who will be on the line and talking to the press when an attack happens and you have paper trailed everything of your recommendation, you will be fine. The organization ultimately, unless you are in critical infrastructure and healthcare, data is at risk. The co company is at risk. Livelihoods are at risk, but not lives. You will be fine. The executives know that they're on the line. Bring it home to them and talk to them in the language that they most understand. Because it's easy for us to sit up here, right? And say, yeah, easy peasy. Uh, we know the solution already for a lot of these nation state attacks. But when boots on the ground, we're not there with you when you're trying to illustrate to them, you're all fired up from DEF CON, from Hacker Summer Camp, and you're trying to justify this expenditure to those people, bring it back to the money and then demonstrate how this is perhaps a minor inconvenience, but it's so much better than the alternative. And you have all of the stories here at this conference to fuel that for your next budget. The thing to consider is psychology. You have to ask yourself, not who or how you get attacked, but why? What is the motivation? And that motivation direct influence to how the attack is carried out. Because there is high value to attacks that are very noisy and very obvious and winds up on CNN. There's also a lot of value to attacks that go unnoticed for days, weeks, months, and years. So understanding the persona of your adversary is so critical to even have a chance to push back, to wear that hat for a day and really consider beyond what this attack or what this person, this human is doing, but what's their motivation? What's their culture? What's their everyday like? Why are they even in that seat? So think about the fact that the other side, there's someone just like you just having a job and well, you are it today for the target. That is a very good point. One, one tech art aspect that I would like to address is, uh, you know, when, you, when we look at the defense versus offense side, uh, so, uh, so the skills are not equal. So on the on the offense side, on the red team side, you would have tools that are uh, you know not enterprise grade if I use that word. So for uh, you know for the attackers, you would have you know what tools like still mimic arts and probably something similar that was written by someone bored over a weekend or just out of interest. Whereas if you look at the defense side, they have a lot better tools. So why is it that it 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 is looked at as a failure of blue side, which is not the case. The only thing that I would like to uh, put in here for the defense is uh, uh, we need to improve on what we look at. So the parameter-based security is long dead. Do not look at it that way. So there are some very good points made by her, for example, to let your executives understand that. Even, even that was an eye-opening stuff for me. Of course, we need to speak their language. But on the tech side, I would say look for identity. So if I may use some very tech words, you know, like say attacks very specific to Windows, credential extraction, overpass the hash, replay of tickets, everything is abuse of an identity to you. Look at that. Can someone steal my credentials? Yes, try to stop that. It is fine. They get it. But when they are using those credentials, that is where you step in. And uh, as you said, you know, uh, you push them back. So. That needs to be changed. Yes, tools evolve. We've got, you know, your Caesars may get, you know, new toys from RSA. I take names, I'm sorry. <laughs> so your CISO may get new toys, let's say from RSA, that's fine. But look at the identity part. That is where everything is. It may be hybrid, it may be cloud only, it may be on-prem only. Do not look at the network. It is the identity that is, it gets stolen, yes, fine, it will. But when someone uses that, you step in and stop them. That would be my advice. I'm going to uh, add a go. Okay. The mic is not letting me speak. Okay, I'm going to add a simple point to uh, you know striker what striker mentioned, like you know the small things. So there is a 
there was an executive okay there was an executive i think he's he's still here somewhere i don't know i don't know uh what he did he was using mfa and uh, he was using google chrome in his office laptop with his personal email account every all the credentials got synced with that google chrome account e gmail account then eventually he used the same account outside <laughs> on a fine morning i i don't know I, always the breaches happens on friday i i don't know the the logic out for that or, or it's it's only after friday or during christmas that christmas new year eve right i don't know how it is i i don't know maybe that's a, that's how the, it works then uh, that email got breached then all the credentials were there some of them might be having mfa some of them might not and this guy he was also using a small extension in his browser as a substitute for 2fa i don't know even even after using 2fa uh, people can actually uh, yeah mess things up right and uh, we have like uh, 15 more i think like yeah 17 more minutes i'm going to add something to nikhil's point as well about uh, the defense part so i always tell people everyone like you know red teams actually work for the defense that's where all the money is they have all the fancy tools you need to work with them you need to work with them very closely to like you know share uh, or provide more value uh, in terms of offensive security assessments right then uh, i kind of uh, started doing that in my life as well i kind of you know got close with someone in the blue team then i had to marry her but then again <laughs> i tell people don't go that far be a friendly be friendly with your defense guys like you know share tactics right share the detection plans then don't go that far right i talk about it all the time right and uh, going back to the panel because we have like 15 more minutes if they don't have anything to say then we can take questions i will not be answering anything all these four guys will be answering your questions unless you don't have anything more to say yeah yeah let's yeah. see what they want to know yeah it's totally up to you yeah could someone get him a mic said yeah 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 hey it's going to happen every time all right i'm just finding the sweet spot oh <laughs> no mic Oh, okay. Yeah. This was for you about the image compromise, right? And there was a image of the signature. Right? Yes. I, I'm trying to wrap my head around it. Why would the adversary do that? Because it's easy for them to open. The, it's easy for the victim to open the attachment rather than the signature. I don't. I don't remember the last time I clicked on an email signature. Yeah. So, so the question had to do with the explicit uh, business email compromise example that I gave uh, earlier. Why would an adversary put it into the signature line? um i actually have a right i believe we presented on this at black hat um that was one of the three case studies that was picked um by my vp mac uh as part of her presentation um so i do have the actual technical information there it is literally just blanking on my head right now i will tell you the motivation for doing something like that within um a subject line, a, a signature line is because if you have correctly targeted speaking of knowing you the persona right my client was a critical infrastructure uh client which means that they're susceptible to nation state attacks like that is one of their targets right if they get in there they can have all of us right so it was worth it to them to investigate the supplier and the type of people that they worked with and do those months and that research that's required days and weeks and months in order to do that right so then to your point earlier you don't want to be noisy at that point right you want to do something that will escape and evade traditional indicators of compromise where you're not doing discovery it's a weird apt spray and pray approach right you're trusting that you did your osin correctly your research and your your um reconnaissance that you have in fact infiltrated the correct one right so that's the first reason why you would do that supplier the second is you put it in the email uh signature line because why would you write the phishing email for them right 
it's it's written by the victim. They don't know their. How often do you guys go and check your signatures? Just out of curiosity, how often do you check if somebody's changed your signature in your Outlook? Are you doing it now? <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't looked at mine in a while, and now I'm suddenly very nervous. Um, and so it's something that it it's a space that you don't think to look, you don't think to check. We're looking for attachments on emails usually. We're trying to distrust that. The email itself triggered, um, I, I don't actually recall what the image was. It did require a click. This was not clickless, as I recall. Um, so something about that image was close enough and familiar enough to the person sending the email that they didn't question it. It led to uh, an attempted sign-in, which was rather clumsy and um, suspected, uh, I, I don't know if I can say, but it was a nation state threat actor that was suspected based on some of the other indicators we saw. Um, and it did lead to attempted credential theft. So I hope that answers your question. Um, yeah. Thank you. If you come up, we will read it back into the mic and not kill you. So when you're dealing with an organization with many, many endpoints, what is the low hanging fruit when dealing with tech debt, when you're starting to implement this? And I'll, I'll leave this to everybody else. I don't know if we have quite enough cord for me to answer this piece of it. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, just one suggestion. If you're talking about an organization that has, uh, you know, 100,000 level systems and it, it has a ton of tech debt, really hasn't done a lot yet, uh, start with inventory. Um, and so it's amazing how many organizations don't know what computers they have, what systems they have hooked up to their network. And it, again, it sounds super basic, but it can be incredibly important in actually dealing with a breach, knowing what systems have need which patches where you actually need to defend yourself. Uh, and it's also sort of impressive how many places don't actually have one that are that sort of scale. So at least that's that's my suggested starting point. Start with your executives. Check their systems first. That's my personal contribution there. I'm going to hit back on the uh, human factor. Without some kind of a way to measure, track, framework, etc., of here's my standard for passwords that you should probably use, or let's not all use the same root password for every server out there. Might be a good idea, but how do you pass those standards down when the organization isn't by people, it's 100,000 people? How do you set that standard where the expected behaviors that you're going to likely have more than one IT team? So how do you pass information along and how do you also change the way people work? Simply put, there are some system that's just a utter pain to get to. So as an IT admin, you're going to come up with creative ways to circumvent your own security to be able to work on things. So how do you set those standards and how do you communicate them effectively to have a expected, we're all doing the same thing? I'll say uh, use the free tools. That's how you find the low hanging fruits. Do not, uh, you know, uh, I keep going back there because that is what I experienced. Do not go for the new shiny tools. Anything that, uh, you know, shows up as, as the ultra cool stuff on your Twitter, on your Mastodon go for the basic free tools that have been like available for eternity, go for them, create your own baseline. That would be a very good starting point. You know, you know, you, all of us, any one of us can be owned by someone sitting in their mom's basement. So let's at, at least try to stop that. So that's where you start. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 So the so, so the question is uh, 
who you think is a, a more dangerous threat, a kid in their mom's basement or an actual professional? Do you want to know the truth? In my experience, it is the kid in the basement because they are not limited by time. They can be very persistent, you know, going after you for six months. Whereas a professional, a consultant, or even in your own in-house security team would need to get that done in 10 days and you need the report on your table by 5 p.m. So the kid in the basement, of course, persistence, consistency pays. Thank you. Uh, so as we all respond enthusiastically, yes, we worry about both. But to your point, that kid in the basement, because that kid's pretty bored. The kid just wants to try things to go. I wonder if this works. If I get caught, do I get charged in the adult as a minor? They have less legal liability, right? So I would worry about that kid 100% of the time. I think this gets back to the annualized lost expectancy formula. Um, I, honest to God, I swear, I'm going to do math to, to my response here. What is the percent likelihood that an attack will happen in a given year multiplied by the dollar value of the impact of that incident, right? Okay. So while the hacker kid... <laughs> God bless us all, uh, is more likely to be find you personally interesting just to say they did it, to see how far they can push, and forget that it's a federal crime to do that. Uh, um, that's more likely. Let's think about what the actual dollar impact to the business is, frankly, right? Meanwhile, an APT is much less likely to target an organization on average, right? Just your average organization they might get caught up in a web, they might be a supply chain attack, but it's less likely that they'll be a direct target. On the other hand, the impact to the business is much greater. So yes, we worry about both. And it's easier to get justification for the APTs because they're like big headlines and no executive wants to admit that they've been pwned by a teenager in their mom's basement or their dad's actually. I had to share a room with my civil engineer dad. Um, but you need to do that calculation and that risk for your own organization and then move forward with the solutions that cost less than the actual expected incident rate. And that is how you will make your finance people love you. And that requires learning about who you think is attacking you and knowing what you have to protect. Uh, I think the question is a trap. <laughs> um, so it, it, I mean, I, I think the only right, right answer to that is it depends. Um, but, and so, you know, which, whichever is successful and causes damage to you in a way that actually harms your organization is, is the one that matters. And that can be anyone, you know, that can be a script that, that got loose, went wrong. That can be just a DDoS that accidentally got released, but took out your network and, and caused you to lose that big sale. And so it's, you know, it's, it, it can be anyone. We, we do have a big focus on talking about state actors because they're a unit that we can really consider that, you know, we've got cool names for them. We might have giant statues of them at Black Hat, but, you know, it's um, it can be anyone that can cause sort of any impact to the organization. I think uh, that's our last question. The goons are about to kick us out. So before that, I will just show add uh, one more point. So this is the power of community, like uh, hacker, the, the hacker community, because uh, we create new tools, we talk, I mean, we teach each other, we kind of, you know, use that into use, you know, increase our defenses. So again, uh, it is always good to be in a in the hacker community. Uh, I mean, I, I would, because in my, from my uh, personal experience, uh, if I'm sitting here with, along with these folks, uh, that is the power of community, right? And uh, I would like to thank uh, the panel, the entire panel, DEFCON, all the amazing goons out here, all the, you know, participants. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot. And uh, shameless plug, do visit Advaisi Village. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>